way that I think is to work with the notion that my mind is not contained in my head but is actually part of the porosity of the forest uh, or wherever I happen to be walking. So they start with small little seeds and then I ruminate and ruminate and they grow in that fashion. Uh, in the Arthurian stories they talk about not trapping animals but trailing animals because many animals are secretly the bone white moon. Sometimes the moon comes down in disguise and wanders through this world as an animal, it's usually a deer. So I'm always aware when I'm trailing an idea it may be a god in disguise. <laughs> That's good. I've never thought, I've never really thought that. I've never said that before. That's why it's good to speak sometimes. There's a few, but the one that I really come back to uh, is, is when it was a Sunday night when I was, must have been about five or six and I was in bed and my mum and dad have a really delightful ritual that to this day to this day they do which is they they cook a meal mid-evening they eat late uh, and they play music like classical music and i was in bed and i heard this music coming up the stairs and i had never heard anything like it and i remember kind of crawling along like a little bear cub along the landing and just bathing bathing in the, in, in, in the dark tones of the music on the top stair coming up. And in my little mind, it was all part of the love tangle of my mum and dad. The music was holding them both. The music was bringing something out of them that was greater than them individually. So in a way, the music was partially the beginning, <laughs> the beginning of me beginning to understand what love could be. As a writer, I'm interested in what I call skin memory, flesh memory, and bone memory. Skin memory is the stuff you put on the CV. You know, in 1988, I worked in a production plant on the cabbage fields of Lincolnshire. That's what that is. We've all, we've all got it. It's objective. Then you have flesh memory. And flesh memory are a little bit like acupuncture points. They're the moments in your life where you've been really touched by something deeply. Maybe it was an, an illness, it was a love affair, it was something that marked you. So when you, when you remember it, it touches you deeply. But storytellers, myth tellers to use a big word, the, the really great ones, the tribal ones, they trade in a deeper dimension again. It's what we call chthonic. Uh, and it's, it's what, what bone memory is. Now, bone memory is when contained in the inner rhythms of some ancient story, there are motifs and images that speak directly to your soul. And you suddenly realize, God, this happened to me this morning. This happened to me this morning. But it's not related necessarily to anything you can claim around you at that time. It's a deeper thing. You think of scientific experiments when chicks are in laboratories who have never been faced with the wild. They put the shadows of certain birds over the top of them and see how they react. You put a pigeon over a chick no reaction. You put the shadow of a hawk over the bird and it immediately starts to shudder. So there is some primordial connection that is more than just the sum of that little chick's experience in the laboratory. And when stories claimed me as a young child, uh, I've had, I've always had access to bone memory. I remember things that, that are not not tied up with the walk of my 45 years on the planet. They're deeper than that. And actually, when you're looking for stories that are robust enough to hold a culture together and our relationship to weather patterns and the movement of the eagle and the, and the, and the, the, the great thinking of the earth, bone memory is what we need. We're living in such perilous times now that the stories that we need have to have that caribou dust in them. 
that has to have a remembering in them. And I don't think one person crouched over a laptop, no matter how inspired, is going to be able to access that bone memory. Uh, yeah, I don't mean to be the bearer of bad news. It's just there, from a tribal perspective, that's too much weight for one person's shoulders. By going deeper into myth, I go deeper into love. And when I go deeper into love, innately, I find morality. I find morality. I locate a true north in my own heart. We're living in a time where we are heavily defended against experiences of our own beauty. What's going on with the laptops and the, and the screens and everything, it means that our gaze is becoming compromised. We no longer feel the 10,000 trembling secrets at the edges of our vision. But go to any indigenous hunter and say, where is your vision most potent? And it is on the edge of things. When a culture is in crisis, genius comes not from the center, but from the edge. You know, people say to me, I love the way you tell stories, it's so enchanting. I have nothing to do with enchantment. I'm interested in waking up, you know, those that knew Jesus Christ, you know, Christ moved like a burning wheel through his life and everyone he laid his hands on, he said the same thing. Wake up, wake up, wake up. The hour is very late for us now as a culture. It is very late and we have to wake up. It's not a question of, it's not just about victory. It's about our capacity to make homemaking skills again in ourselves for something that is bigger than us, that we learn to bend our head again, uh, that we learn some humility. We were caught in an old love affair with the tumbling earth. And if our time is drawing to a close, should we not make beauty with it? Should we not? What possible fucking message should we be giving our kids other than that? Mm. Oh, Shenandoah, I love your daughter. Oh, way you rolling river. Oh, Shenandoah, I love you, daughter. Away, I must away. Oh, that why.